Hey everyone, what's going on? My name is Stephanie Graham. I'm an artist and filmmaker, and I'm also an extremely curious person. Some will go as far as to say that I am nosy as f- the nerve. <laughs> I started this podcast because I wanted to interview people. I'm not just talking to anyone either. I'm talking to people who are in the thick of what they do. I want to know how they live their life and how they get things done so that I could apply some of their savvy to my own life. I'm sharing this with you so that you too can do the same. We can do it together. We all got to start somewhere. And if you're not looking for practical info, stick around anyway, because my guests are fascinating and it's my goal to get to the bottom of their sh. I mean, aren't we all just a little bit curious of what it's like to live someone else's life? And if we do it the same? There are also times when I will feel called to catch up with you one-on-one and let you know about what's going on with me, either in life or with my art practice. You didn't think I'd get the dirt on all these cool people and not let you know what's going on with me, did you? I mean, I'm a Libra. We believe in balance. Listen, I am a big believer that even though we are all different, we can still find ways to relate to each other. It's time to get down to business, so welcome to the Nosy AF Podcast. Hello, nosy enthusiasts. Welcome back to another episode of our exploration into the lives and stories of fascinating individuals. Today, we are taking a vibrant trip through the world of art with the incredibly talented Meg Franklin. Hailing from the picturesque landscapes of Georgia, Meg embarked on a creative journey that led her to the heart of the art scene in New York for around 15 years. But you know what? Sometimes life has other plans, and Meg found herself back in Georgia surrounded by a bunch of cats she accidentally acquired along the way. And guess what? She's a painter with a dream. The dream that we all secretly share, which is to ditch the regular job and paint without distractions of office life. In this episode, we dive into Meg's New York adventures and explore the vibrant strokes of her paintings that emanate brightness. Do her colorful canvases reflect her outlook on life, or is there a deeper story behind the hues? Join us as we unravel the layers of Meg's artistic journey. Side note, do you guys like my NPR approach? How am I doing? Let me know. (laughs) But listen, here's a thing that I ask Meg, which I have tons of conversations about all the time with all sorts of artists, and that is, do artists really need to be in the hustle and bustle of New York to make it? Meg is going to share her thoughts on this age-old question and reflects on how her artistic path has evolved outside the concrete jungle. And speaking of evolution, Meg gives us a glimpse into her time at Pooch Cove, where we became friends, and the masterpieces she crafted in the serene setting. So also, we're going to explore her criteria, what makes a good painting, and how she navigates the world of art. Meg, with her unique blend of humor and artistic insight, lets us peek inside the canvas, sharing stories from her solo and two-person exhibitions and the gallery spaces where her work has come to life. So, my nosy friends, grab your paintbrushes and join us as we venture into the colorful world of Meg Franklin, where art meets wit and dreams of painting without the nine-to-five hustle persist. Get ready to be inspired, amused, and thoroughly entertained on this episode of Nosy AF. Let's jump in. So, Meg, yeah. I'm so glad that you are talking to me for this podcast. So, Meg and I met at Hooch Cove, the residency. And how did you come to being at Pooch Cove? Through Elaine Spafford. She's an artist who I'm sure you'll talk with, and she does abstract works. And she found me on Instagram, like, truly 10 years ago. Mm-hmm. And I, I don't know why, I like, really like my paintings for some reason. And she would like, they were, you know, fairly inexpensive because I was just really starting out. And she bought a bunch of them and I would ship them all to Edmonton, Canada. And I had this like <laughs> idea in the back of my mind that it was actually my mom catfishing me <laughs> to like get painting sales for me to make me feel better. And they were actually all just like going to a storage unit in Edmonton, Canada. <laughs> It turns out Elaine is real. <laughs> I mean, you met her. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So she invited me to do it. And we just kept in touch on Instagram for, yeah, like I said, a decade. And we'd never met in real life until Pooch Cove. 
Oh my gosh, that's so cool. So it's like real legit like Instagram yeah. friends. Yeah. <laughs> sure. That's really wild because yeah, I know. I'm trying I've met one of my really good friends through Twitter and we would just talk and then one we we realized that we worked in the same area. And yeah. then we met after work to she's an artist too, like for us like to co work before we went home and then we started to like meet up after work. So that's yeah, funny. That's cool. There are a bunch of people actually like art world wise that I knew first from Instagram and then knew in real life after that. Especially because like living in New York, well, I don't anymore, but I did. And so many of the people that I was following were just there, you know? So I could say, let's do studio visits and we could just do that, you know, because we're all in the same city. But I imagine I won't be meeting people as much now that I live in Georgia in that way. <laughs> well, Atlanta <laughs> has, well, are you far from Atlanta? Because they have a big I'm art community. I'm an hour away from Atlanta, but I'm like really spooked by driving. And oh. Atlanta driving is particularly bad because I was in uh, New York for about 15 years and I didn't drive at all. There were like a couple of, maybe times scattered around that where like I remember once my mom got sick on Christmas day and I don't know my dad couldn't drive for some reason and I had to drive to CVS for her to get some medicine and then like mac and cheese which was our Christmas dinner that year I was so petrified because it was like I don't know only like a I was in in Georgia but northeast Georgia farther away from where I am now and it was like just a 10 minute drive each way. And I was totally petrified. It was anyway. Oh that, man. That's really going off topic, but yeah. uh, Atlanta, <laughs> no, I'm not going to drive to Atlanta. So Instagram, right. I don't know. Yeah. Listen, <laughs> Instagram and virtual studio visits sound good to me. I mean, yes. <laughs> thankfully, you know, the pandemic, like I've had tons of meetups with folks, you know, through zoom and then, you know, like you'll have studio visits and then it's like, especially if it's artist to artist and somehow they'll have like a show in Chicago and they'll be like, oh, by the way. And I'm like, oh, really? Then you can go and see it in person. And it's like, oh, we were talking about this artwork. So I think it's, yeah, it's totally, yeah, it's possible. You can do whatever you want. That's the great thing about being an artist. You can do, really do whatever you want. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, so I think there, oh, go ahead. No, 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 go ahead. You think. Well, I was just gonna say, I think there are some formulas people have figured out to be like, kind of more successful in that world but like yeah a true artist you can do whatever you want yeah you know (laughs) so you are a painter how did you get into painting well I'd always liked you know making art like as a kid and then I don't know if my dad remembers this and probably might make him mad that I'm saying it but it's true I remember when I was a kid, I remember exactly where I was in his car. And I said, did my dad like, oh, I wanted to go to school for art. And he said they wouldn't pay for it if I went to school for art. And and it's really nice that they would pay for it at all, you know. So I'm like, okay, fine. I want to study art <laughs> in college. So I studied English and then went on to do creative writing because like, I guess that felt allowed. And I got an MFA in that. And then I moved to New York and I just wasn't as interested in writing as I had been. And I realized that it was like very painful for me to write. And I felt like I didn't have anything to say at that point. But I just kind of casually started doing paintings and then found that I actually enjoyed the process of it. There was like no real pain involved. And then from there, I also had an office job that I really, really couldn't stand. Uh, You know, like a cubicle and with terrible lighting and, you know, like... (laughs) five days vacation time. I I felt like I was in a trap. So I wanted to get out of that world. And I felt like (laughs) art too could take me out of that. So yeah, that's how I got started. And that painted just like not, I mean, for me pretty seriously, but for like three years. And then I applied to graduate school and went to the New York Academy of Art in, in New York. And then there is where I learned, I guess, how much work because I was surprised by how late people would stay in their studios working because like when I went to creative writing MFA school we were just like at the bar all the time you know (laughs) yeah (laughs) the painting world is very like labor intensive in that I think it took me a while to like want to put in that effort but then of course I got there and it feels weird not to be working all the time 
Yeah. Oh, that's cool. Your paintings are so vibrant. So I'm excited for the audience to see them because I really love like bright colors, like neon colors. And so I was so excited when like I saw your work is like this like black background and these like super bright colors. But before you got to that, you were doing velvet paintings. Yeah, a lot of paintings on velvet until really recently. And I still have tons of velvet, so I'm sure it will reappear. But I think I got kind of frustrated with that because you can't really make mistakes. And mm-hmm. so I was really trepidatious about doing anything because um, I wanted to keep the, you know, velvet, have areas of it without paint on them. And if you make a mistake, it's really hard to fix it in that way, you know? So I would have to like plot out the paintings in advance and then like oftentimes like use a projector and like draw with kind of like chalk line on the velvet. Anyway, so I just got sick of feeling like I didn't, I couldn't be very loose or have a lot of freedom with them. So then somehow I arrived at just using a black background, but that's really recent. And okay. I don't know if I'll stick with it or not. But I mean, the next few paintings I have planned are on black backgrounds like that. So when you did the um, velvet paintings, were they also bright? Yeah. Okay. Most, I really like the warmer side of the color wheel. Like I don't, maybe with pops from the other side, but I'm I'm not big into like blue and green paintings for some mm-hmm. reason. Yeah. But yeah, I don't really, I tried to think about why my paintings are so bright and I don't know except to say that I'm, we can come, I can become really, I don't know, just captivated by color. Like sometimes I'll watch, I love watching Fantasia over and over. That's one of my favorite. Oh, episodes. yeah. So really. And I'll just like basically drool at the colors. I'll push pause and like take pictures on my phone. <laughs> and, like, yeah. I'll make, like sound like I'm eating and it was delicious. Like when I see the color combination. <laughs> so mm. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Oh my gosh. Fantasia is really good. Do you like Alice in Wonderland? Too? I do. Yeah. yeah. That's also nice. I watched that one not too long ago with my niece, but I don't know. I guess with Fantasia, just mostly not having dialogue or it doesn't have dialogue, except for the conductor who speaks in the parts of it. But I think that just allows me just to focus on the visuals, you know? Yeah. Whereas Alice in Wonderland, I get caught up in like what cookie she's eating when she's big or she's small. And exactly. You know? Exactly. I know it's funny. I'm going to have to watch Fantasia again because I feel like when the visuals that come up for me, it is a lot of like blue and black, but there are, it is blue. That's true. Yeah. But it does have like that black background, like the pop. So it's Mm -hmm. like, it is sort of like your work in a way, which is really cool. I just like made that parallel. Well, I haven't seen that in a long time. They should show that movie a lot more. Like there's a rooftop cinema here and they're like, they should be showing Fantasia. That would be a fun. Yeah, it's perfect for something like that. Yeah. You know, people could like talk a little bit. It doesn't matter. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Yeah. So like, what did you think of the colors in Pooch Cove then? Absolutely. <laughs> well, I know that when I got back to Georgia, I was like, oh my God, what is this green explosion? <laughs> Because, like, Pittsburgh was gray and gray, and it was just gray. I mean, blue sky and blue, greedy water, but everything else was gray. Like, I think I saw some purple flowers. A couple tulips were blooming right as we were leaving. And then, what other colors did I see? In nature? I feel like that was about it, right? Like, roly-polies were gray. They were everywhere. I know. I'm like, uh, the bones that maybe you saw are like cream. (laughs) (laughs) But Rolly Polly's actually, if you squish them, which I'm not willing to do, but if you do, their blood is kind of like blue gray. Oh, okay. Well, that's could have done that. That's pretty. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) It's interesting because I was just looking at at a picture with someone from Pooch Cove and it looked like it was super, super green and the rocks were all black. Like it was like really, it was really pretty. Yeah. And I was like, wow, this is really pretty. Because well, it's like, it seemed like maybe, I don't know, if, I have to look at it again if the sun was out. Yeah. Because I feel like in any color still has that like, like a gray wash over it. Right. 
Yeah, definitely. I feel like my memories all, even though it was a good, exper- a really good experience, I feel like my memories all kind of have like a gray filter on them. Yeah. Just through my paintings, I guess. Maybe, yeah, I was going to say maybe the, all the color was a response to that, but I always paint really bright. So, yeah. <laughs> so, like, what did, what were you working? Were you working on anything particular in a Pooch Cove or? Well, did you I have was a plan? working on, yeah, some paintings that, I started out with an image that I really liked the colors and it was of uh, a Muppet. And it's funny, <laughs> I told Deirdre at Cooch Cove that she was the only person I'd ever told that they all started from a Muppet and she was, but I've still <laughs> been a couple more times since then, like not that anybody really cares. But so they started with a picture of, I think his, his name is Mr. T in the Muppet band. Now I'm losing my... That does, they do have the color palette of a Muppet. You're right. Yeah. I know. I think I know who you're talking about. I'm picturing, I can sort of picture that. that Mr. Band. T. I think that's his name. Mr. T. Okay. Let me see. Yeah. I need to find that out too. Cause I did know. Oh, Dr. T. Sorry. It's Dr. T in the electric mayhem. So oh, I'll yeah. Oh. Images of him and some of the other band people. And then I like, Oh, he's put so them. cute. Yeah. <laughs> Aren't they funny? Yes. I put them in my iPad and then like just kind of scribble over them and then go into other apps and like warp them all sorts of crazy ways until they start to resemble other things. And then I play with the, you know, other things. And that's what I was working on. So like I took what began as Mr. T mm-hmm. became... I guess the first painting I did, it was like two kind of, I don't even know what, how I would describe them. Strange, like column looking figures with like what seemed to have one eye kind of looking like they were fighting one another. That was one. But then a couple of the others I did were up flowers. So I took some of the paintings that I'd done based on Dr. T and then Warped the paintings, yeah, crazy amount. So then they became this flower. So like, there's basically no way that anybody would look at any of them and see Doctor T. But that's like where it started. And then I had a bunch that I did a few years ago that started with a painting I did of Betty Davis from a movie, and they look like nobody would ever know that they started with a painting of Betty Davis, but they did. So like, in addition to watching Fantasia, I would say one of my favorite activities i was going to say visual activities but just activity is manipulating those photos in this little app on my phone it's like nothing high tech at all it's like one of those like face distortion apps that i downloaded probably like eight years ago and i pray some like it continues to work forever because i need it but it just more the things around so that like you can start with a face but then after like say You morph a photo, then morph that photo again and morph that photo again. You can end up with, like, a a mountain range. And I love that, you know. And I wish that I could do that on my own in my brain. But it's also just so fun to see the surprising things that show up in the app. Like, I'll, like, squeal. I get so excited if something cool comes out. (laughs) Yeah, no, that's really cool. And, like, as I hear you talking, it's like, oh, wow, there's, like, really, like, this, like, like, fantasy, Mm -hmm. like, yeah playful like magical piece to your work because at first i'm like oh it's interesting i wonder if she has like a relation to sesame street or <laughs> really the muppets. i thought well don't go didn't the muppets come from sesame street or are they there yeah, all they're all jim henson yeah 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 so maybe oh. that's funny maybe it's more obvious than i think but yeah i mean the color schemes do stay kind of the same and i do love like i guess i think sesame street started in the 70s and i love I like that aesthetic a lot and those kind of colors. Yeah, it's it's really cool. I was actually watching a clip of it was like it's actually really sad. It was like Big Bird. It was about death and Big oh, Bird no. like realized that somebody had died and they're like, mm. oh, where's Mr. Such and such? And they're like, remember, we talked about this. He's oh, like, no. when's he coming back? It was really sad. I'm just Long like, oh, but I know really- he's not Big Bird. But yeah, no, it was just like so sweet. But like thinking about the colors, like mm-hmm. Big Bird was like a really bright yellow. And I love yeah. Sesame Street as a kid. Like, 
my parents got me a big bird cake and like a candle. Uh-huh. And then when they lit it on fire, I started crying. Because oh, I was like, you guys are burning big bird. And then you're going to eat him. <laughs> what? <laughs> like, what kind of mess is this? But no, that's cool how... It's just cool, like, how those characters just stay in people's lives forever, yeah. you know? Also, I think it's, like, just the first stuff I saw is the stuff that is the most important to me. Like, the first color schemes I saw are still so important to me. Or, you know, like, there was this painting, or it's actually just a fabric print, but of some strawberries that was hung above my brother's crib and when he was little. And somehow that just stuck with me forever, and it's, like, bright, bright red bright yellow and then he had just kelly green carpet in his little bedroom and i I guess those colors were just all around me when i was a kid i mean my mom and dad like bright colors so yeah i feel like it's just kind of a first exposure and then like latching onto that type of yeah it's interesting bright colors always make me happy and then like i always try to like incorporate bright colors like into my like branding and stuff but then i'm like it doesn't look it doesn't seem always necessarily work for me even like personally even though i love seeing it in other people so i'm like oh maybe it's just for me to appreciate not for me to like have as a part of myself or whatever so and that's that's how i feel about like less saturated colors i love browns and like taupes and that sort of thing in art and i've done some paintings like that just kind of for myself, not that I really consider like my, you know, standard work. And they're totally different types of dick matter. Um, but yeah, I can cannot commit myself to just painting in that way. It's like I'll always come back to the brighter stuff, even though I like the other stuff. So. Yeah. Yeah. I've learned like it was interesting because being in Newfoundland, like with everyone, everyone was like painters, essentially. I mean, Deirdre Dez does like installation work mm-hmm. and it made me just like look at painting in like a different way. Like y'all were talking in like different language, like, oh, yeah, I have to get my stretchers built and all this stuff. And I was just thinking like, oh, I thought you just like went to the store and you would just buy a canvas like. Or like rolling paint, like when people are like rolling paintings up to take home. I was yeah, like, oh my yeah. God, isn't that going to crack? I don't know. It was interesting. And then, of course, at, you know, James Baird Gallery, there's like so much painting around. And it just made me like wonder if you had, like, is there like a structure for like knowing if a painting is good or not? Because some of it I'm like, oh, that's beautiful. You know, but then some you're like, oh, that's beautiful. But then some of the other painters are like, well, you know, like they can critique it like from a painter's eye. And I'm like, oh, man, I really need to get my like painting game up because. Well, I mean, you did. I guess it's like a, te- a thing you develop. I mean, there are things that when I first started painting that I loved and I look back on now and I'm like, and I think that, that mostly it's just because I didn't realize that they were using like almost like easy gimmicks or like, I think it can be really hard to pull off tons of drips now, but when Uh I was younger, I would like thought that was the coolest thing ever. And like, you definitely, you can make it work. Sherry, who was there has a lot of drips in her work and it it completely worked, but yeah, like I'm not typically a fan of like drips anymore. And uh, what else? Oh, I don't know. There's a lot of stuff. Definitely where I'm, like look at things and just kind of be like me <laughs> well yeah because it's just like and there were some paintings where i'm like oh that looks i cannot draw i like say all the time i am not a person that can draw i'm always like interested in maybe trying to take a drawing class or something but when i would see some of the paintings where they were they were like drawings but they were painted if that makes sense like and then I would try to like draw it like, oh, that looks simple to draw. And then like I would like go back to my studio and try to draw it. I'm like, oh, never mind. <laughs> yeah. So like when they would look so simple, but they're actually like pretty complex. And I don't know if that's just because I'm not someone who draws or yeah. if it really is hard, you know. There's a lot of artists like that where I'll see their stuff and I'm like, man, that looks so such a simple thing to draw. It's like the Simpsons, you know, like the Simpsons feel like easy right. to draw. But if you're well, not... I don't know how animators do that. I don't know how yeah. they learn their character so well that they have the mind to draw them from all the different angles and moving. And like, that's just beyond the way my brain works. I can't do it. Yeah, yeah. Well, so like massive appreciation of people who can do that. But For sure. I like 
basically can't paint from imagination at all or draw from imagination. I mean, I can draw from imagination, but it, you know, is really wonky and I don't love it. So I always have something. That's why I think I do this digital manipulation thing because then I have something I look at and then I just paint from that. Yeah. Hey, I just want to pop in here real quick to let you know that I'm an artist. I make work about social class, subcultures, race, and gender. These topics are complex, they're interesting, and they come up in my life all the time. Because I love to laugh, a lot of my work has humorous tones. I genuinely enjoy making and creating all sorts of things. My main medium is photography and film, but I also enjoy organizing art events. I would love to keep you in the loop of everything that's going on with my art exhibition. So please consider signing up for the Studio Graham newsletter at MissGraham.com slash sign up. Okay, back to the top. Do you have favorite painters? Oh, Lord. I do, but like they're always, they're always changing. Oh, they are. Uh Yeah. And for some reason, I always just freeze out when people ask this question, but like, um, (laughs) Trying to think about who I was thinking about most recently when I was working. Charles Birchfield, I was thinking about a fair amount recently. What's his work? What's his work like? He does like landscapes, basically. He that kind of he paints in a way where the the, the, the it's wavy. You like there are a lot of kind of wavy areas and then different color swaths within the waves and I don't know I just love the way that he everything feels kind of rippled and I don't know I really love his work okay Charles Birch I'll have to check him out Birchfield yeah Birchfield yeah yeah so you know really quick back to New York I'm glad you even though you're back you like move back you're like okay I've done this I'm out do you think that all artists should like experience New York like or having been in New York there is like people speak of New York as like, this is the Mecca. This is the place that you go. You know, s- similar to in filmmaking, LA is the place that you go. You know, people have definitely moved there and then they move back, you know, or they might move and they set up shopping. That's the rest of their lives out there. But I don't know. What do you think about your, do you, yeah. What do you think about your experience there now that you're out of it? Yeah. I've been away for a full year now and I'm, much better in a, a smaller environment, like quieter place. Town I live in now, I feel like, I think the county has like 100,000 people. I could be wrong, but it's not, it's not very big. And like I have pumpkins growing in my yard now, you know. Oh, like no I way. I have <laughs> anything like that before. So, so far my experience with painting has been, I mean, good I you know I'm in a more comfortable spot mentally so it's easier to work but yeah that like networking aspect has to be done digitally now but I also was never great at that to begin with I wasn't somebody who liked to go to openings in New York like I always have had a other jobs too you know just along with the painting and so it's like had a fair amount of friends who have minimal outside work beyond their studios. And I think for those people, it's a lot easier to be able to, you know, do tons of studio visits and go to all the openings and make work. But when you add on and have another job to that, yeah. it, it becomes like, okay, if I'm going to cut one of these things, it's just going to have to be the openings and all of that because A, I don't really enjoy it. And B, you know, I got to pay my rent and I have like, a need to make the work. So it was, so basically that was a world that I kind of not entirely stopped participating in, but like did to a large extent stop participating in. And I, but I really did love having studio visits with artists at their studios, like one-on-one meetups with artists. I really loved that. I love that. Like if you say I found somebody's work I really loved and then, you know, they like followed me back or whatever, then we would lots of time set up studio visits. And, and that was really wonderful. I used to feel really lucky that I do that, like the openings and all of that. No, thank you. Yeah, that is nice when you can like, it is one thing to like, I feel like when I go to openings, it's like, okay, yeah, I go to see the work and then you, you're you talking the whole time and then you like, but you're basically like looking to link up with people later. You're like, well, we'll just get together 
later. And it's really hard if the opening is your own because right. <laughs> then it's like a mix of like, like my girlfriend will be coming up trying to tell me like what happened at a party last night. Like, yeah. wow, there's like another like gallerist coming to talk to you, but you're just like, okay, give me a second. And then while that gallerist is talking to you, then maybe like, like some random person off the street who has a question. It's just like, right. oh my God. Your mom <laughs> does up there, right there. Yeah, I know. Yeah, it's like, host, right. And then like my grandma shows up and it's like, <laughs> oh my God, now you have to stop yeah. everything. And I know. Yeah, it's a lot going on. I will say I always loved going to friends openings. That was something I enjoyed because that's, you know, important to see your friend's work or the work of the artists that I really, really cared about. But like just to go and like see and be seen, like, yuck. And it would always give me just such a like, sad feeling about art too that like I, I think I used to think some things were beyond like who you know and and all of that but no none of it is really yeah it's like no. all about who you know yeah I feel <laughs> yeah like so much is I mean of course like talent and you know innovation and all that does play a major role like it really matters who you know yeah yeah I look, do you have friends who aren't artists or are your friends artists? No, I, most of my friends are not artists. Okay. I was going to ask you, because like when we were at Pooch Co, you became like besties with Connie. <laughs> I did. Oh, uh, who's also on the podcast. And I just wondered like what you thought about like artist friendships, you know? I mean, I love being friends with other artists because I think that we have a a lot of similarities in like visual excitement and all of that, but like, and you know, artists that I tend to be friends with often make kind of stranger work. And, you know, I like to make strange paintings, but like in terms of being part of like the art world together, I rarely would really want to discuss art with my friends. Like, I don't think Connie and I ever like just talked about our work, you know? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's like this thing that you both do, but I don't know. I, I It just kind of icks me out a little bit to talk about it sometimes. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. This, like, th makes you think of... I remember one time a girlfriend and I, we went to a party. And I'm not, like, a person, like, at a party who's, like, with their drink. Like, yeah, so, like, what do you do? But she is. And it just, like, it just, g like, gave me anxiety every time she would do it. Because I'm like... Mm -hmm. Why do you care, like, what this person does <laughs> like, at this party? Right. <laughs> Answer probably like, is she does it. <laughs> no, I don't know. I know, right? And then, like, and it's weird because the like, person's like, oh, yeah, well, like, I, like, work in aviation. I'm just like, oh, <laughs> I'm like, who cares? <laughs> uh, and I have, like, another really good friend, too. We barely talk about work. We're, like, in sort of, like, adjacent careers but i mean I, I can't even tell you what they do like i right. just know that it's like in advertising or whatever but I have yeah like you're not no familiar idea. with their they're like linkedin yeah exactly i, I like, hate linkedin <laughs> oh my gosh with so many artists be telling me like that linkedin is sort of the plug though like for consultants oh, i don't care no yeah you just like <laughs> it's I'm like really it stresses me out so bad <laughs> and i've been like I probably like registered with it at some point to like look at somebody's profile because it won't let you do it otherwise. And like I had the hardest time shaking LinkedIn. It was like a stalker. It felt like like I had. Oh my gosh! Like, subscribe like seven hundred times and yeah, I'm not a fan. Yeah, social media is one of those things. Like I like technology, so I'm always like following what these different companies are doing. Like it makes me laugh because some people hate LinkedIn. People either hate LinkedIn. <laughs> or they forget about LinkedIn, but then yeah. those who like use LinkedIn are like thriving on LinkedIn. Oh my gosh, that's such a different person than than I am. I just I know, and I'm just like, dude. I'm like, how? Like, how do you use it? Like, I have a profile, but I feel like if anything, like art centric, like the Instagram is the LinkedIn, and sometimes even if I don't want to, like. Before we got on the call, like when I was looking at pictures from Pooch Cove to post and all that, it's like I'm trying to have a better relationship with LinkedIn or not with LinkedIn, but with Instagram. <laughs> yeah, because I want to be able to have fun because I feel like it's necessary to be there as an artist, even if I don't necessarily 
yeah, like the platform. I had a friend, Amelia, who is completely off social media. She actually has a podcast about leaving social media. Oh, cool. And when I think about it, I'm just like, I don't know if you could. I mean, you could do anything you want, right? But I'm just like, mm. yeah. I don't know. As an artist, I think it's just better to have like figure out a better relationship. I don't know. I think you're right. I think it's pretty important to have it. But it also, it was really fun when it started out or when I was first on it with artwork because it was still like, I guess, becoming this like essential device for the art world. And, but that was, it was so much more freeing. I don't know. I posted a ton more and let my, I guess, personality show more than I do now. Now, like every post is like semi-calculated, which I don't like. And Right. I know. I want to just get back to like having fun, but then that's like with the, uh, yeah, I get it's weird because I'm like, oh, is it okay to like post one photo? Because it feels like that's not the thing anymore. You're supposed to post like three. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Or something. No, I know. I it, it's, What used to be fun is now kind of stressful to me. I, I used to have kind of like a bit of an Instagram checking addiction. And in the past, I would say five or so years, I really, really pulled back from that. And I've been a happier person. Yeah, for I, like, sure. I did the app on my phone so that I have to like scroll through. I mean, now my fingers just know immediately how to do it, but I have it like, you know, like five pages away on my iPhone in like buried in some folder. <laughs> oh, that's a good call. I was thinking about starting to delete it on like Fridays and then just like re-download it on Mondays. But then I'm like, then it becomes the whole behind the scenes stuff. Like, should I let people who like I share memes with know this? And then so that way when I come back Monday that there's just going to be a bunch there. Right. Or just let it be like, I don't know. I don't <laughs> I know. It's hard. Yeah. But I definitely think I am going to try. Maybe I'll try tomorrow since that's Friday to like start deleting it. And then seeing how it goes over the weekend. Because I have done Instagram breaks and those are nice. Those are nice. And it does remind you of like, wow, you're like really checking this thing a lot. I know. I can feel my thumb moving right now, like talking about it, like <laughs> trying to locate it in my weird folder. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. Well, OK, cool. So like now that you're back home, like what are you working on now? Like what do you what do you think you have coming up or anything? Oh, you know, I do a fair amount of like portrait commissions. So right now oh. we're a painting of uh, my friend's child. I'd done her other child when, I don't know, a while back, like six years ago or something, and she wanted kind of like a, you know, matching piece of the other daughter. So I'm doing that, and I do like, I'll, I'll, you know, when that comes up, I'll do that. So that's what I'm doing right this second, but I'm also working on a larger version of the flower that I was talking about, that okay. the Muppets. Yeah. And then it, like has this other weird manipulation of one of the Muppet, you know, painting that kind of turned into like these ducks. So the one I'm working on right now is this like giant flower tree over the water with strange ducks swimming through. <laughs> and it's it's fun to do. It's a little out of my comfort zone because I get worried that floral things will just seem kind of too light or decorative. So I'm struggling with trying to make sure it it feels like interesting enough to me, you know. Yeah, decorative can be interesting. Flowers yeah. never go out of style. That's a good point. You know, <laughs> yes. I love flowers. Yes, I love them in real life, but I'm always not not always a huge fan of like floral art. But it can be done, you know, yeah. and well. I'm, that's what I'm working on. I'm trying to yeah. do it. It's a challenge. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, my gosh. Well, Meg, do you think there's anything else we should talk about before we call our conversation complete? Well, this is a sort of a sad topic, but it's weird that St. John's, Newfoundland, where we were for, you know, so close to, has been like all in the news recently because it's the long night for finding the people who, I guess, did die on the Titanic site. That's just so funny. It's like St. John's, you know, on like the national... I mean, okay, it's capital of Newfoundland, I know, but a lot of people here don't really know about it, and it's small, and that's where we just were, so that's odd. I know, that is wild, you're right, like, I'm like, I'm think wondering, like, is there, like, a bunch of press over there? And you know what, I feel like, too, maybe this is stupid of me, but I didn't realize the Titanic happened in Canada, 
Yeah, I, I for some reason I knew that it sunk there, but I mean it was still really far off the coast. It's just that St. John's I think is like the easiest access point. Okay, yeah, because when I was looking up like I was like looking up like fun facts and like I saw the Titanic. And it was so weird because, you know, like where our studios were, like the Atlantic Ocean is like right across the street. Yeah, I know. And so I was just like, the Titanic is out there? Yes. <laughs> and I'm like, whoa. And also like what's what's been so crazy is like they say that the. I don't know how they were able to get footage of the Titanic before because they're like, oh, nobody can ever dive that deep. And I'm like, well, obviously somebody did because. Well, all from like submarines, not not like anybody out swimming around. Like you have oh, to like be, there's like cameras on the submarines or something. Yeah, it had to be super pressurized because the water pressure there is so intense that it just like these people at, le- at least like. You know, they did die, and it seems they did. It probably would have happened like exceptionally quickly because there was like a leak, and then the water, the pressure just like, you know, so that's unbelievable. Yeah. When I'm just like, because you know what? I didn't, I only really knew about that story yesterday when everybody was just sort of talking about it. Like, I didn't know this thing had went missing and all that. Yeah. And I'm just like, what? And then I've been seeing people making jokes, and I'm like, guys, this is terrible. I know. This is terrible i know like i I don't care how much these people pay to go down there or whatever like and they've done it before the a guy from the simpsons the simpsons guy all that yeah yeah so it's like okay well obviously somebody's able to do it and they've been back so right and i just can't believe that and so i don't get in front of a situation like that and i mean i guess days before nobody knew that it was over for them but still like that's not cool to me Yeah, I don't think it's cool either. And I just hope like, yeah, that it was just like a quick thing and they were gone because I'm like, that is just horrible, like thinking about that. And then like their family is like, that's just it. Like if you like lose your loved one at sea and then they're just gone, that's it. And also to die on the spot where so many other people died, you know? Yeah. Strange. I know. They were saying that, like, one of the people, like, their family, like, their family was a part of the first Titanic. Yeah. I think the wife of the C- chief executive of the, I think it was called Ocean Gate, the, that made the submarine, her, like, great-grandparents died on the Titanic. That's insane. Isn't that weird? Yeah. It's, it's, it's a messed up situation. It's, like, a complete tragedy. And then another thing, too, somebody put, like, a, like a chart up. Of like to show just how deep the Titanic is. Yeah. I just never seen that before. They're like, no, it's like legit on the ocean yeah. floor, y'all. I like, have I have chills bumps on my arms and legs right now because there's something about images of under things like that don't belong underwater underwater to me that just freak me out. Like the concept of cave diving. And I was also just thinking about that because it was like we got lucky with those kids in Thailand that yeah lived, you know. Yes, yes. I a good story like that too. But yes, like, oh my god, it just freaks me out. It's such another world there. Yes, and when we were in Newfoundland and we went to see um, the icebergs, and you would see like like pieces of ships. Did yeah, you see that. I'm yeah. just like no, okay. <laughs> It is scary. It's like, I'll never forget I was in Cancun. (laughs) And we like went out on a boat. You know, like we were all supposed to go snorkeling, but it was sort of raining and the waves Uh were just like, and like the lady's like, if you don't know how to swim, do not get in that water. She's like, you have to respect the water. And if you don't know what you're doing, today is not the day. And so like me and I was like, you know what? Okay, maybe I won't go out there. Because at first I'm like, I'll have like a vest on while I'll be holding on to something. Okay, but. No. And the rest of us stayed on the boat and like took pictures of each other. Like right. there was like a couple. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, they like in their swimsuit. I was like making them like hold each other like on like the the like net part of the boat. Uh-huh. Well, it's so stupid because I'm just like, yeah, let's just not go in that water. I know. I mean, it's 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 scary. Yeah, it is scary. It's it's pretty crazy. So yeah, and just like yeah, it's like, what the heck happened? Where did that thing go? I know. I feel like there must have been like a leak and just the tiniest leak could cause that whole thing to 
collapsed. Yeah, and I can't even believe that when people went down there the first time that they were able to get, I'm like, you all went all the way down there and were able to get back up? Like, how? I don't understand. It's just, it's just insane. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Odd. Yeah. But it is wild that like, we had like that great time together. And then like, now there's just like this tragedy. I know. I know. Yeah. Real. When I'm yeah. See, I have something morbid to say because I was like, oh, I have <laughs> how I wanted to have my coffee shop there. I was like, see, as reporters, reporters could be having some coffee. You would have been selling a lot of coffee right now. <laughs> yeah, I would. <laughs> Housing these reporters and stuff, talking. Yeah, totally. <laughs> James is like hosting them at the gallery. Yeah. Just don't make any sort of special drinks like named after the expedition or anything. Oh, I know, right? <laughs> oh my gosh. I wouldn't dare. I would not dare. Just, yeah, but no, it was definitely fun being there. Are you going to do any more residencies, you think? like I'd like to. It, this is actually the first one that I've done, and a big part of that was that now I work remotely. I work mm-hmm. for a logistics company that's out of Brooklyn, and I worked there, you know, in person for the before I moved. And now that I don't, I can just take my computer and work from wherever. So, yeah, now that I know that I can do that, especially if the residency is open to having somebody who has to work outside of the studio, which luckily this one. Yeah, I'd love to do more. How about you? Yeah, I definitely want to do more. I really enjoyed being there. I feel like we were sort of spoiled with this first one because we had such free range. Like I was like looking at other ones where... They're like, oh, you have to, you know, help cook for everyone. Or I think um, Yvette was going to one where you had to like work out in a garden for like a few hours a week. And it's just like, what? And then, yeah, so I feel like us having like just these like super cute apartments for a month, you know, working. I know. What a dream. No restrictions, really. Yeah. 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 So, but yeah, you know, I would love to because I know like I think they're good for your career right before the pandemic or for sure during like the shelter in place I was really not that inspired I feel like it really zapped my creativity honestly and then yeah and so I feel like I'm slowly but surely getting back to that and getting back to like having ideas and stuff and even when I got the opportunity to go to Pooch Cove like I had no idea what I was going to do but I definitely knew I needed to like get the asset stuff together like my websites and whatnot so in my podcast so I was able to like work on those and at first I'm like well this is like sort of I'm not really making but I'm like no this is supportive and that was you know a time that you could just focus on that like my mom said to me the other day I hope you keep your website updated and I go I don't even know if it's like active anymore it's live like do I still pay for that thing or not I don't know and that's terrible terrible like thought of of typing in megfranklin.com right now to see if it still exists like is basically as scary as cave diving to me. Like, I just don't want to deal with that, that like aspect of things. So, well, it's there. I commend you for dealing with it. (laughs) It's there. Thank you. Yes, it's definitely there because I've looked at it several times. That's so well. It's very unupdated, as I'm sure you know. (laughs) That's okay. (laughs) At least you know it's there. So you don't have to like go there and see like a 404 page. That yes. was like, that's what I figured it was. Be so but, devastating. Know, there are a bunch of other Meg Franklins in the world. I'm sure there are a bunch of other Stephanie Grahams too, but I get to my Gmail because I was the first to claim Meg Franklin at gmail.com. Uh-huh. But I'm seeing like all of these like emails meant for these other Meg Franklins and they all have like very pampered lives, it seems. Oh, actually, one is looking for jobs right now and she's driving me crazy because I'm getting all of her job search. Oh, no way. Hell, yeah, it drives me bonkers. It's like, Ugh. Um, yeah, you know, there is another Stephanie Graham who's an artist, and I bought one of her work. She does like oh, needlepoint. Cool. Yeah, she does uh-huh. like needlepoint, and it was like animals. And so I got nice. like a bear. Yeah, I'll have to take a picture yeah. and send it to you. It's like a bear with like a hat. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah, like a I winter like hat. And she, yeah, yeah, she let me pick the color. She let me pick the oh. color purple. She sent me like three different color purples, and I got to pick oh, one. That's so that was cool. Yeah, did that she was get pretty cool. In, did she get something of yours? No. <laughs> well, you need to talk to Stephanie Graham. <laughs> I know. Two. Say like, listen, this is supposed to be an exchange. I know. I buy from you, you buy from me, okay? So you're never <laughs> set for a <our> name. <laughs> I know. And then somebody, and I didn't know, 
I ended up with the Miss Graham.com because Stephanie Graham.com was taken at the time. And now it's up for grabs, but it's like $1,800. And before it was like a long time ago, because I would check this over time. It was like six or 800 bucks. And I'm like, dang, I should have bought it at that time. Yeah. Yeah. You know, like, but sometimes I think about, and I still might do this. Like I think of like, and find some type of fundraiser, you know, like some for fun. But then it's like, I've had that Miss Graham for so long, but maybe it would be nice to have. I don't know. Right. No, you know, I'm really, I'm really into names. I used to have this. Now this website is dead. I know I stopped paying for it, but it's the hand. It's my Instagram name, which is Gabuldra. Was it, I dreamed it. It was just a dream I had. And it was like really clear. This name just kept going through my head. Like Google, 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 Google. I don't know. Oh, I love but it. This, I had this character and I would do kind of like per- performance art pieces in a way with it where she would try to come up with unique names, like names that nobody else had in the world. And the way that that you could get like the seal of authenticity would be that I would like, you know, g- Google it in quote marks. And if nothing came up, then that meant you know, <laughs> nobody else had that name. And but then I got so legitimately angry because like some other, like what seemed to be real name, namer, <laughs> another neighbor made a website and was like, go and, and was naming people for like $20,000. They would give your child its own name, like completely unique name. And there was like board and they were going around to all of like the morning shows and, and being in, in no papers. way. I got so mad. So then on my little website, I launched like a fake attack against them. And, you know, I, I really, really loved com, and I should bring it back because I really doubt anybody bought that. Oh, you definitely should. I have so <laughs> many domains like, oh. yeah, I have so many domains just like from yeah. ideas because I use I use like names to frame works too or even just ideas like I need a title and then I can go from there if I go back and change it later that's fine but I need it to get started it helps me to like right get started so yeah so I totally I totally understand that I totally understand that yeah (laughs) (laughs) oh my gosh so fun well yeah well thanks again for talking to me thank you it was really fun Thank you so much for tuning into the Nosy AF podcast with me, your host, your friend, Stephanie Graham. I'm so glad that you made it to the end of this conversation. Please kindly let me know what you thought by leaving a rating and review on Apple Podcasts, on Spotify, Stitcher, wherever you're listening right now. You can also connect with me at nosyaf.com via the Say Hello button. And if you're curious about what's going on in my art and film life, please visit my website at missgram.com. Oh, and also, if there is someone that you're nosy about and you want me to have them on the show, please send suggestions via the same hello button and I will check them out. Until next time, thank you so much for being you and see you soon. Peace.